Welcome back. Happy summer, Woo-hoo. everybody. Welcome back to Hoops HD. Uh, it is Monday, June 26th. The college baseball season is about to come to an end. and uh, But we're here talking about college basketball. Yes, we are. I'm it, Chad Yes, we close out this year. We got David Griggs, who uh, one of Dan Doctor's biggest fans of, over here on one side of me. David Dorman on the other. John Titel and John How could you agree Bromley. with him when he called me a dipshit? Well, why did you do that? <laughs> He was right. <laughs> no, he wasn't. <laughs> Anyhow, guys. He's um, trying to say I'm some sort of fake or something, like I'm a puppet or something. You know? uh, we, well, while there are, is uh, not much going on in the college basketball world this time of year, there's, there's been a few headlines, and the biggest one has probably been what happened with at West Virginia with Bob Huggins, uh, first with a suspension for comments he made on a radio show, while it appeared that it sounded like he was inebriated during the show, uh, and then afterwards, after agreeing to a to a suspension, suspension and restrictions and the like, uh, turns around there's a DWI, and now he is officially done at West Virginia. I believe the official word is retirement, but uh, he is no longer the head coach there. And uh, uh, Titel, why don't I start with you? This is a guy that has been head coach as I think as long as I've been following the game, maybe longer. Probably longer. <laughs> Definitely longer. I mean, yeah. just to give you an idea of his past nine months. So like September inducted into a little thing I like to call the Hall of Fame. And then six weeks ago, uh, he uses the anti-gay slur on the radio and gets, I would call it a slap on the wrist because he was still coaching. Then he blows a 0.21 with a blood alcohol test and then he decides to resign. So it's been quite a month, quite quite a year for Huggins. Um, the thing that is going to stick with me is that like it's really because when you're a hall of famer it's because you've accomplished so much good stuff obviously but you start to look at the guys in the 900 plus win club in ncaa tournament ncaa history you got bayheim the ncaa vacated over 100 of his wins back in the day roy williams had the academic scandal at unc bobby knight choked a kid and cussed out everybody in the world like I wish there were more coaches who could do it the right way. Not, I'm not saying they're all cheaters. I'm not saying they're all terrible human beings. But, like, I wish you could, like, stick around long enough to coach 900 wins and be a decent human being. Maybe the thing here is that if you coach that long, you're going to screw up. Maybe that's yeah. maybe it's just that's a problem. But That is a fascinating nothing. observation, I got to say. <laughs> like, I never connected those dots. Uh, but, yeah, a lot of people that are way up there in the win total – uh, Titel's right. They they certainly have their wards. Um, go ahead, Chad. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just gonna say Stalika because because being a being in the Cincinnati area uh, and Huggins making a good portion of his career there. I just wanted to get your thoughts on it as well. Well, this was not the first time Huggins has had uh, trouble behind the wheel. You have to go back <laughs> to about 2004, 2005 when he was still the uh, Cincinnati head coach. He gets pulled over by the. Uh, Fairfax police under uh, similar circumstances and about a year later when it became clear that he wasn't going to be cleaning up his act then you see President Nancy Zimfer puts up an ultimatum and ultimately fires him now where she caught heat was this happened to be almost a year after the DWI or DUI at that point I believe so what happened to Huggins at that point was he was out of the coaching game for about a year then goes to Kansas State for a year before he began his uh, head coaching career at West Virginia. Obviously, the slurs that were said on WLW are rather unfortunate going after two different communities. I mean, he was obviously suspended. I think there was word that part of his, he was going to donate, I guess, a million dollars towards uh, anti, well, and it was, let me get my, Whichever group, right whichever, it, was, it was a donation. I hope that donation is still going to happen, actually. I you know, <laughs> assume it did. Well, cons- well considering he's no longer going to be employed by West Virginia, we would hope that would yeah. be the case. We don't know what further is going to happen beyond that point. But given that he was in uh, Pittsburgh thinking he was in Columbus, he's obviously got some bigger issues right now. And hopefully he gets the help that he's going to need. Hopefully keep him off the wheel of a car any time in the near future. Yeah, yeah. I, I got a couple thoughts here. Uh, getting back to what he said on the air, uh, the, the anti-gay slur that he used is abhorrent, but he also said something 
that was interesting while heavily inebriated. The accusation was that nuns were throwing rubber penises on the floor during okay, the Xavier. Okay, we've gone too far here, I think. <laughs> now, now, I don't know if that's true or not, Stalika, but I, I'm guessing it isn't. But, oh, my God, please say that it is. Please say I remember. I remember back in 2002. Uh, that, I want there, that to be true more than you possibly can. Now back in 2000, yeah, 2002, there were some audible f bombs. We've lost the podcast, the, everybody. We've the lost it. section, but that was the first I had heard of rubber dongers and an accusation okay. like that. <laughs> I've completely lost control of this podcast now. I was trying to have a serious subject. Uh, Dorby, let's try to get it back on track. It is a, sh it is a shame that a it, coach with this yeah. many wins ends his career this way. It, it, absolutely. And let's take it from a different angle. Is In this day and age, you have so many ways to get around. You have – he has all the means he needs. Uh, call for a car. Uh, your, there are innocent, wonderful people on the street next to you that are driving home from work, that are driving home from taking care of their parents, that are being, you know, doing so much good in the world, and you're going to ruin their life. You got to think about others. And it, get, call an Uber, call a taxi. You, you have a million friends in the area. Anyone will come pick you up. Uh, just make the phone call. It, it, he's done this way too many times. He's gotten lucky a few times and no one else was killed. But uh, at some point, you got to learn your lesson. All right. uh, let's kind of move on here. The other big news, I think, in the last month or so, well, it's been a lot of news about players transferring. Uh, we're still seeing some graduate players still announce that they're leaving schools. I think Javon Quinley was the most recent one. But aside from that, uh, the NCAA announced a whole batch of rule changes that are coming to effect next year. Uh, starting Griggs, of course, with quarters and half court warping on timeouts. Oh, wait, no, we did not. No, no, we, we, <laughs> like I, I prevented this from happening. I went to Indianapolis okay. and stormed the gate. Like you might recall, I was texting you from there. Uh, actually, there, there were, uh, by my count, a dozen rule changes. Some of them are fairly minor, but I think let's, let's go through all of them, real, all of them, different amount of times for each of them. But uh, starting with the block charge rule, there's been a, now a change to the block charge rule that the defender must be in position before, not before the player goes airborne for the shot, but before he plants his foot before he goes airborne in order to draw a charge. Otherwise, it is a block. Uh, Titel, it's a nuance. This should lead to less charges and more block calls, though. Is that the whole goal here? I think so. I mean, it's. Uh, I think even in the NBA, people acknowledge all the time that it's the toughest call to make in the game. Um, I don't know if there's an easy way to solve it. I mean, this is certainly, it sounds like a good step, but um, is it where the guy's positioned? Like, does it matter how high he's taken off or how close he's to landing? Like, I think it'll still remain a gray area, but anything they can do to make it more clear is always better. Yeah, the, the, to quote the exact rule, it's a defender will have to be in position to draw a charge at the time an offensive player plants a foot to go airborne to attempt a field goal. Previously, it was just when he went airborne, not when he planted the foot. So it's like it's, it's a half a second difference now, that uh, tenth of a second difference. <laughs> I don't know how, how officials decide this. I guess that's my point here. Um, <laughs> or whoever wants to respond. Well, I, it, yeah, because it, it is like like a lot of things a judgment call. I think this gives more. It's trying to turn it into more black and white, and I like the attempt. I just think that that by the time it's mid December, it's going to be what it's sort of always been already. <laughs> And Dorman, I think that we've, seen, we've seen that with major rule changes where they've tried to revise these rules before. Is is they call plays strangely for a month or so and then we just yep. kind of revert to a norm don't we yep we get about two or three weeks and these officials try and press it on everybody and then everyone screams and about a week later everything goes back to how it always was so yeah. i think that this one like you just said shit it, we're talking about what quarter half seconds here who's going to be able to see the difference i do agree with titel it's that they feel like there's been too many charges the last few years they're trying to make it more i guess towards the blocks, which I, I don't understand the whole rationale, but this is going to be very hard to call. Yeah, I know we're going to be screaming about plays where we see players that look like yeah. they're clearly in solid defensive position getting charged, called with a block, not a charge. Um, 
And, uh, Griggs, the next one here, I know you were big on this. Uh, oh. Preloaded and live video can now be transmitted to the bench during a game. And I know that there's not enough people watching TV during games. Now, now more bench personnel can watch TV during a game. Uh, do you yeah. Care? I, I, I don't. I, <laughs> okay. As far as the fans. I'm going through and, the, the order of my screen here. So, hey. Right. So, so um, yeah, I, I know that the for the fans, they won't even notice that this is a rule. And the players probably won't either. I, I guess the coaches. I, I guess my question is, well, why not? I suppose. Uh, yeah, sure. If you want video fed to a device on the bench fine the thing is i think a lot of coaches were doing this anyway with iphones because there's so many games are streamed now that um you know and it's generally a stream is about 60 to 90 seconds behind the live action so i think this this was occurring anyway uh now it's allowed so great Good rule, good rule. I mean, I am so happy the rules committee uh, gets together and and makes decisions like this to make the world a better place. Uh, the, the the rules committee also said that that goaltending and basket interference calls uh, can be reviewed by officials any time during the game. They will do it at the next media timeout, um, not necessarily holding up the game. Fairly minor rule change there. Uh, also, Sleeka, uh, we're now allowing bench personnel. To go ahead and serve as peace, peacekeepers during altercations, it's not a technical foul anymore. Oh, there have been a few <laughs> uh, bench clearing incidents in uh, recent years, but I think even in the NBA, there was an incident several years ago. I think it was involving the Suns and the Spurs, where players were leaving the bench, and the Suns ended up having to play like a, a critical playoff game with only five or six guys because a bunch of people ended up leaving the bench and drawing automatic one game suspensions. Hopefully uh, this will try to stem some of that tide a little bit. Yeah. Uh, let me clarify just, just to be sure that the players are not allowed to leave the bench. The personnel, as Chad put it, can, that would be the yes. assistant coaches. Uh, in the past, they were not able these, these to. These are bench personnel who are yeah. not students is the official rule. Yes. Go right. Ahead. Yeah. I, I never understood why they couldn't before. I always thought it was a little bit ridiculous that an assistant would would go out there clearly wanting to stop a fight or prevent an altercation. And because they did what I thought we would want them to be doing, they would be ejected from the game. Uh, this is a good rule, in my opinion. I don't want to dominate. The, if, I feel like I'm the only one talking here. Uh, well, let me else. go to Hytel for the next one, even though Griggs yeah. is probably one of, you, one of your favorites. A uh, uh, little more significant here. Uh Previously, the rule was when a coach wants to challenge a, an out-of-bounds play in the final two minutes of the game, it, he just do it, does it, and they look at it, and that's it. They're finally going to assess the team a timeout if the coach asks for a review on an out-of-bounds play and does not get it overturned. So help coach cut down some of these ridiculous replays. I love it. Um, less so the ridiculous part, more the replays part, in that like it seems that there were a couple tournament games, none specifically come to mind, where just the action slowed down to a grinding halt because there were so many replays towards the end of games. And like I understand you want to get it right, which is why I don't think it's ridiculous to go to the replay every so often, but we don't need it like every 10 seconds, and there should be some disincentive to trying to do it. So I think that that's a good rule. Well, I'm um, sure when the NCAA tournament is involved, they'll always love an excuse to uh, go out to their corporate champions in a commercial yeah. to <laughs> review things. But I think the other caveat here is, is my understanding is you have, you can challenge as many times as long as you have the uh, timeouts necessary to You're do so. And you win the challenges. Right. Uh, another uncertainty I have of this rule is that a lot of times in the last minute of the game, referees go to the re replay without being asked to anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Th this is and, just on coach and, requests. Yeah. Right, and yes. they take it, 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 a ridiculously long amount of time. Sometimes uh, one of the things I was going to get to at the end is rules that were not implicated or, or weren't changed. And one of mine is going to be that a five minute delay it is far more disruptive, especially if it's so close that it's taking you five minutes to decide to overturn a call or not, than simply letting the call stand and getting on with the game, whatever it be. Yeah. Uh, people think I'm joking. Like with this situation with the uh, replay, that uh, I, I really mean it. The last five minutes of the game should the only should be the only time in the game there should be replays. 
That's it. The refs call stand the rest of the game, the first 35 minutes. Let the five last five minutes be replays. That's fine. Play the game. It's way too disruptive. There's way too many little insequential things that don't matter. You're ruining the flow of the game. You're ruining yeah. the great game. I'll tell you what, Dorbin, because I'm going to take a little bit of an issue with that a slightly by skipping ahead a couple of rules here, but but they did change the one of the rules – with flagrant fouls. So are you saying if there's a flagrant foul in the middle of the game, you shouldn't do a review? Uh, because one of the rules here was that uh, if they fi- if they find on a review that there was a flagrant foul and they originally called a foul on the other player, they can now take that foul away. Previously, they would you'd end up with fouls on everybody, which was kind of stupid. Um, but they, they're now allowing them to take that foul away. But this is something that, that replay only figures out for you. And that's kind of an important thing, though, if you have you know that type of altercation that leads to a flagrant foul, isn't it? I would be okay if you have caveats towards a flagrant foul where uh, someone might be ejected. Yes, I, I'm okay with stopping the game there. There's a that's a serious situation, no problem. But these, yeah. but who who knocks the ball out of bounds and throwing it off each other? Like we don't need to stop the game that many times. It's not that important. You're ruining the flow of the game. Play the game. If you want to check the last few minutes, I'm all for it. Also, just real quick on the flagrant foul rule as well. Uh, any player now that gets three flagrant ones in a game is ejected from the game. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen anybody get three flagrant runs in a game, but no, no, no. if it happens, yeah. it'll be an automatic ejection. Uh, I don't remember seeing two, much less three. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Titel, sh- the shot clock will now reset to 20 seconds anytime the offense retains possession of the ball in the front court. Even if you put up the shot with 30 seconds left of the shot clock, you get the offensive rebound. It goes to 20, not even saying where it was. A little slight pickup of the pace of the game, I guess, is the only point of this one. By vanishing 10 seconds out of my life, I guess so. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I, I, I don't know. uh, Um. I, I don't care that much, but it seems like there's an the incentive to increase the number of possessions in a game. Why? I, I mean, I, I love the shot clock at 30 because I don't think you should be able to stop the game, to stall the game. But I do think that there is something to be said about being able to control the tempo. And if you continue, and if you continuously try to push the tempo, you sort of take that away. A uh, couple of minor ones here. Players will now be allowed to wear religious headwear without getting a waiver. Uh, red and amber lights will both be allowed on backboards. Yeah, we're getting technical here, but one yeah. more pretty interesting one. Uh, well, there's two more left, but one more pretty interesting one has to do with timeouts. Uh, oh, if you remember, the old rule used to be if you have possession of the ball, you're falling out of bounds, and you have you're not in fully in bounds, you were allowed to call timeouts, and people would grab the players would grab the ball, go flying out of bounds, call timeout in midair, and it would be a timeout. They got rid of that. Well, Griggs, they're bringing it back. Yeah. As long as you have possession of the ball, no matter where you are, even if you're flying through the air 10 feet out of bounds but haven't hit ground yet, you can call timeout now. Okay, I, I wouldn't mind this one so much, with the exception of the one uh, of the one man that can call timeout without possession of the ball, and that's the head coach. Um, if you have to have possession of the ball to call timeout, then the coaches should never be able to call timeouts from the bench. I I don't I, I'm against live ball timeouts entirely. Uh, so you, you know where I stand on this. Yeah, I, I mean, Dorman, I thought it was great when they got rid of this rule and, <laughs> and they didn't let you do it. I, I don't understand bringing it back. Why? This one doesn't make sense to me at all. I, I like that you need the ball, you need possession. You have to be with your feet on the ground to call timeout. I'm, I'm with you, Chad. Flying out of bounds and you have it for a half, a quarter of a second, and getting the possession just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, sus- I'm with you. I suspect a couple coaches that were on the rules committee were probably lobbying for that change and ended up getting it. Why though? What does it do? I don't know. Uh, uh, Titel, the very last rule change here. I know you follow a lot of the stats and you follow a lot of the numbers and you're going to see some brand new numbers of the box scores because officially started this year, players will be allowed to wear any number from zero to 99. No longer has to, be, <laughs> be, has to have to have a zero through a five in it only. You're going to see players could be number 68 or number 77 or anything like that now. <laughs> I hope the refs grow a few more fingers because they're, they're going to signal a 70 70- Eat. <laughs> the foul, they're going to have to run out of fingers. Um, no, it's always nice to um, give players more options. Um, I wonder if there will be some st- like uh, zeros and double zeros, which is always fun. 
Um, I can't try to think. Sadly, we're getting so old that like nobody's going to have like their birth year because there aren't any like 98 or 99 guys left, I fear. But um, no, it's nice. I like it. Well, if you want to go to the way back machine, George Mikan did wear n- number 99 at DePaul. But if we're talking more recently, I think Bronny James wearing number six at USC is going to be the first one that comes to mind right here. I would imagine it's probably a relief for schools like North Carolina and Duke that have been retiring jersey after jersey and are running out of numbers for their current players. Uh, that kind of brings me to the topic that Griggs already started a bit here. I wonder for each of you, any other rule changes that you would like to see that we did not see here? And Griggs, you kind of mentioned one already. You want to follow up on that anymore? Or? Yeah, I'm not for doing away with replay entirely, but I am for extreme replay reform. I, I kind of like what the NFL and I, I think college football does to where there's a limited number of challenges. A team has to ask for it. Um, I like the standard of um, what is it? Indisputable evidence. We don't have that in college basketball. So the reason I would like that is because if you're taking a minute and three and four and sometimes five minutes to review a play, in my opinion, if it takes longer than 60 seconds, then by definition, there must be some sort of dispute. So the original call should stand after 60 seconds. That would be the two changes I would make. Like there needs to be a challenge where you you lose a timeout if you if you lose the challenge and indisputable evidence should be the threshold not it's too close let's get like if you're looking at something for five minutes it's too close to call so stick with what you called in the first place and I revert back to what I said earlier the five minute delay is far more disruptive than than a, than getting a call wrong that's that close anyway. Um, one of the pro- th- there were games last year that were ridiculous. I want to say it was Purdue, Michigan State. It took over twenty minutes to play the last sixty seconds of the game. Yeah, I'll throw this out there too. What really annoys me sometimes is when the two officials go and look at the video monitor. They can't decide. They bring the third guy in. I think a single official of the three should be designated as a replay, probably the crew chief, and yeah. perhaps even though if it is the crew chief's call, they're challenging. Then you have a guy who's designated as the one to review it, so you're not reviewing your own call. Or let let the crew chief review everything either way. But we don't need multiple people reviewing the same thing. Let's just choose a single replay official. Just one guy that'll make the call. Like in the NFL, the head referee yeah. reviews the play. They don't right. bring over five linesmen to look at the video monitor also. When, yeah. when he's and I got to confess, I, I really don't watch other sports. <laughs> but it seems to work far better in other sports than it does in college basketball. So Let me, let me throw it over there. Are you telling me you don't want a war room in Indianapolis watching all of the games in D1? and I, I, I decisions would. On maybe replay. not all of the games in D1, but maybe a war room at the conference office. Where they're watching all the games. I I want a war room in Indianapolis watching every single game at every level. D1, D2, D3, NAIA, junior college. I Uh, propose that Rocco be the replay official. Remember that? (laughs) Uh, Dorman, your thoughts on any other rule changes you you wish we had seen this year? Quickly on Griggs is why don't they let the, the fourth ref or the alternate ref that's already sitting at the scores table with the TV in front of him, let him do it. He's already sitting there with TV. Let him do it quickly. Give him a minute. If he doesn't yeah. have anything, we move on. But my play would be give everyone six fouls. I want to see the best players play, and I want to see, you know, the game. I know. I, I like the physicality. I like the best players in the game. I would give everyone more, one more foul and go to six fouls. Right. Titel. Hate it. I want the best players <laughs> in the world, best players in the country to not foul five times a game. Yeah. Anywho. Uh, one rule that I want to not get rid of is a 68 team tournament. Uh, I've heard rumors of 96 or God forbid, triple digits. And like, I understand there's money. I understand, um, as, as teams that have missed out here and there, like getting a little more in would help more people, but, um, ain't broke. Don't fix in my humble opinion. Uh, one rule change I do want to see is with NIL. It seems like it's not getting under control anytime soon. There's state laws. There's it's federal very laws, out of control. Yeah. There's boosters. There's big money. Um, it seems like it's still a mess, and it doesn't seem like we've made a ton of progress in the past 12 months. So uh, I hope that somebody does something about it. Yeah, the, and the combination of the NIL and the transfer rules, it, it's just those two have interplayed to a point where it is 
mass chaos free agency uh, every year, free agency. You have more of a free agent in be- college basketball than you are in the pro basketball, where you, you might be stuck with it. You really are stuck with the team that you signed a contract right. with. Um, one of the thi- one of the ways the NCAA went about trying to rein this in, because they, they I, I know you all know this, but for the sake of the audience, the reason this happened the way that it did and played out the way that it did was because of what was happening in the courts. Uh, states started passing laws saying that that athletes were entitled to NIL, that it was a civil right. I, from a legal standpoint, agree with them. I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't have that much of an issue with it. But they were just not prepared for it to happen as quickly as it did, both with transfers and NILs. They have decided to petition Congress to get special status for for intercollegiate athletics when it comes to antitrust laws. And, and they are not having much luck. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that, really. Yeah. Uh, Sleeka, your thoughts on any of the rule changes? I know we like to needle the puppet about bringing quarters into the no, game. No, but no, what no, I think, no, no. No, seriously, what I think 10-minute quarters will do, no. it will uh, speed up the flow of the game a bit. You're not going to have situations where you're going to be spending like the final 10 minutes of the half, especially the second half in a foul trouble here, getting them to reset every – 10 minutes or so or so should speed up the game a little bit. I'll I'll throw one other one of the one out there. I really don't like the fact that that you can make a great defensive play, get a tie up and the offensive team just gets the ball back again because of the the way the possession arrow is is facing. Um, I want to go back to jump balls. And well, I know, I know there's complaints that the officials can't toss it up. Well, send them to a camp and let them learn how to toss the ball up. Well, well let hard. me ask you this, Jay. I've never heard the officials can't toss it up. What what I thought would happen would just be that it's an unfair advantage to whoever the taller player is. So why that, that, not that, just get okay? So here's my. I, I've seen enough jump balls in, in in the NBA and the ones they do have in the college games that that the taller player does not win 100% of the time. Okay, well, why not just do this? Why not just give it to the defense? Like, in a tie-up situation, whoever had the whoever had the ball that indicates th- that the shot clock relates to loses the ball well, every but time. You, but you do have some tie-ups that are not forced by the defense. You know, for example, if the officials determine that two players simultaneously knock the ball out of bounds, they could go, go to the possession arrow, a.k.a. Yeah, jump ball. I, I, so I would give a, it to the defense. Uh, okay. Um... I guess on that note, um, what are the topics that we have? Oh, Grace, I think you want to discuss, and Ty Teller hinted out a bit, the, the, this transformation committee uh, yeah. thing. So one of the recommendations is that for all sports at the Division One level, that the championships, and for basketball, that would be the NCAA tournament, uh, would, would, would invite roughly 25% of the membership. That would be somewhere between 90 and 96 teams. Uh, one of the reasons I've heard they want to do this is to give more teams a chance, which I, I think that that's incredibly flawed logic. And other things that you hear thrown around was that it would generate more revenue. Also flawed logic. I well, think, not, fl- not flawed at the basketball level. I think it's more flawed at some of the Olympic sports levels there. But Yeah, well, well, let's look at the basketball level. Like, for starters, the, I, I don't think the NCAA or the people on the transformation committee specifically have really taken the time to ask the people that give them the revenue whether or not this will generate more revenue. There is a contract in place until 2032. Uh, while this was a while ago, or 2004, one I think it was it was over 20 years ago but it's not like it was so long ago that there isn't a memory of it when it went from 64 to 65 uh CBS basically said we're not paying for that like we're not saying you can't do that but that's not going to be an NCAA tournament credit and the first year it aired on some off channel and then ESPN not CBS actually had the contract for the opening game so if they didn't want one more game what makes you think they're going to want 32 more well i think that the difference could be if they actually added another week to the tournament uh that might be the big difference because you you would to add in another round of weekend tv commercial revenue but that being you, you said, might be right, but don't you think you should ask CBS and Turner before you just assume that they're going to give you all this money? I'll tell you what, though. I personally, I think Ty Ty, you already told us your opinion on, on expansion. Uh, Dorman, I personally kind of don't agree with Griggs or Ty Tell. 
I think we need to go back to 64. I think 68 is even stupid. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm from the old school. I like 64 better too. Um, I don't need to play in games and not because no. it's not good basketball or those teams shouldn't be there. I just like an even not amount of games for everyone in the tournament. I think everyone should be on the same footing. Um, I'm with you. I don't think the uh, expansion is needed here in the tournament. Um, I, I, I think they also, the NCAA basketball committee, should see how these conference situations play out before they start making the uh, tournament bigger. Let's see where these teams start to land and how the how everything looks across the landscape in these conferences before we start adding to the tournament here. Yeah, I think they also misjudge the why the, the tournament is appealing to so many people. The vast majority of people that are NCAA tournament fans, I don't know about the vast majority, but over half are NCAA tournament fans more so than they are college basketball fans. And if you start to take out, if you start to have 10 to 12 conferences every year that almost never see the round of 64, I think that appeal goes away a little bit. I think there really is something about the model that we have now that is intrinsically interesting to to watch whereas it would be less interesting if we didn't have that i obviously there's no data to back that up but i just think that if you ask a lot of people for instance uh the olympics i don't know anything about gymnastics or swimming but if you told me that the best gymnast in lebanon and i have no idea who it is was suddenly not allowed to compete or not allowed to compete at the same they had to win more so that more people from big countries could come in i'd be like well that's kind of dumb why are they doing that and again i'm not a gymnastics fan but i'm an olympics fan and i think a lot of people are ncaa tournament fans in the sense that maybe not more so than there are college basketball fans but for the people that are college basketball fans, and I think we all fall into that category, the regular season is awesome too. Like, why would you mess that up? Why would you take the excitement away from what I think is the most exciting regular season out of all the major sports that we have? Because of how it plays into the tournament. Good point. I, I, I'm with, I hate to agree with you, but I'm with you here. And honestly, I think what your very first point, going back to when we started the topic though, Griggs, this is, no matter what this transformation committee says, it comes down to what do the TV partners want and what are they going to pay for? And that's yeah. going to be the real answer, whether we get expansion or not. And if the TV partners want to pay more money and get more games on TV, guess what? The, the If they called up the NCAA tomorrow and said that they want that for next season, we're having a bigger tournament next season. I tell you, you're will. nodding. Yeah. Because you're right. <laughs> yeah. they're, the writing the, they're writing the checks. Okay. Uh, I, I would tell them put more regular season games on TV and explain why they're important because of how they play into the they're not. They're not going to pay as much for the regular season game as they will for tournament games. But yeah. all that being said, uh, that's all I had for tonight. So why don't I just run through each of you for any other thoughts or anything else you want to bring up for tonight or any final thoughts? And uh, Sleek, let me start with you. I know I'm wearing a Xavier baseball jersey, but the one under the radar team I do have to give a shout out to for this spring season is going to be the Oral Roberts Golden Eagles. Now in basketball, they've had a Sweet 16 appearance in 2021, but this year they were able to uh, crash the party in Omaha and make it to the uh, College World Series and ended up winning one game before getting knocked out by the Florida Gators right here, so... I will give them uh, credit right here. I think it was their first College World Series appearance going back to either the 1970s or 1950s. don't remember the exact year. Uh, becoming a sports powerhouse there at Oral Roberts, yeah. uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, the hotbed of college sports. Uh, uh, Dorman. <laughs> I'm going back to the, uh, to the replay here. I just think that they're ruining the game. They're slowing the game down and they're just making it so, so choppy. They're just overthinking it. These, these don't need to be reviewed. It just does not need to be looked at with 14 minutes to go in the first half. And uh, it just, like I said, the flow of the game is way more important than this one silly early call. So move the game on, keep playing it. Let's go. Yeah. And, and I don't know. And the NBA pulls it off somehow. I, I don't know why they, 
I don't know what the NBA does that's different, but it works. It, it doesn't seem to have this. To have this. I mean, Titan, let me ask you that and then give you your final thought. They have like challenges and stuff, don't they now? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, so I tell, I think you, follow more, you follow more NBA than, 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 than I do, but, but I don't think the flow is that awful in the end of the games like it is in the college game, is it? It's not. I mean, they have the thing where you like hit the button for the green light if you want to challenge. Um, and what's funny is you see like, the biggest stars in the game, like in the first quarter, they get a block charge call and they're like, Hey coach, let's re-. the coach is like, we get one of these, like the whole game We're not <laughs> yeah. until the fourth quarter. Chill out. Um, I think they also have like professional people in the NBA office or whatever, like looking at it, who've done this a thousand times and the technology and the money to everything. And I think that the refs themselves are also better in terms of, getting the call right. They miss a couple and sometimes they don't know and they're like, screw it. Let's go see what the replay guy says. But um, I think it is different than college and pro. Any other final thoughts from you also? Yeah. So um, kind of following up on Stalika's college world series thing, but a little different tack. So uh, we're an hour or so away from having our fourth straight college world series champ from the sec Vandy 2019, Mississippi state, 2021, Ole Miss 22, and either LSU or Florida, probably LSU in 2023. And that got me to thinking because, you know, in college football, the last four years, Georgia back-to-back, then Alabama, then LSU, four in a row for the SEC. But then we come to basketball, and it's been a bit of a dry spell. So the last champ was Calipari's Kentucky team in 2012, and then he made it back a couple years later to the title game before losing to Kevin Ollie in 2014. It's been over a decade without an SEC team making – the title game since 2014 or winning it since 2012. And I don't get it because like we saw Florida win back to back in the Billy Donovan era. We saw Patino and Tubby Smith make the title game three times in a row before my Wildcats beat them one year in 96, 97, 98. And now it's just a dry stretch. I mean, that's kind of because there's a lot of other good teams with good coaches, um, Villanova, UConn, Duke, Carolina, whoever, but like, why is the SEC so good at all these other sports? Just not so perfect at basketball. I'll tell you what, though. If the SEC was that dominant in basketball, uh, that might be the end of the NCAA. Well, yeah. Why don't you just have the SEC tournament decide your national champion in every sport? Because uh, oh, you're yeah. right. They are so dominant in everything, maybe other than basketball. I think right. Well, got when, that. One of the things about basketball is when you look at the national champions, uh, there isn't a conference that has a conference other than the Pac-10 Pac UCLA that – that routinely won four in a row. I mean, you see that more in football and baseball. For I think he's reason, been pretty yeah. dominant lately, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, with the Villanova titles in UConn. But yeah, Riggs, Villanova and UConn. Uh, um, you want to finish the show off for us here? Yeah. Getting back to this wasn't a rule change as, as, as far as a rule between the lines, but it is something that I would like to see changed. Uh, and it's something that could be voted on and passed immediately if it could get the support, which it won't, but it should. I, I think the number of non-D1 opponents in the regular season should be cut from four to two. The rule now is that it's four, but that's including the exhibition game. So if you play an open exhibition game against a D2, D3, NAIA, that is one of your four. More and more schools are playing closed exhibitions, and then they're scheduling four non-D1 opponents I don't think the fans like this, but uh, I don't think the players like this either. I, I think the coaches that are under a lot of pressure to build up their win total just want four easy wins, and that's the only motivation for it, and that's the only reason this rule exists. I, I uh, and, also, then, and then and yeah. then Griggs, though, then those same coaches, if they do end up with a bubble team, complain why yeah. why didn't we get in? Well, good. It, it, the, the committee has been very, very specific on we do not want you playing non D one games. Like if you, if that is not how you impress us. Um, I, I just don't. It, it's not. I, I mean, I support D two and D three, and certainly appreciate what they're trying to do. But I, I just don't think this is good for anybody. Like to have four non D one opponents and. We follow under the radar quite closely, especially Chad and, and, and David Dorman, and we hate these games for them because they've essentially, it's almost like 
they're not eating as much of their vegetables as they should. They're just going straight to the dessert and eating the cupcakes. And I think a lot of under the radar schools have hurt themselves by scheduling three and four non D one opponents every year. They should, I hate this and it should go. I'm not saying don't play any, but four is ridiculous. That's like a third of your out of conference schedule. Uh, I agree with you. I don't like, I don't like the four. I'm okay with two. Yeah. Uh, I'm, think two should be your limit though i agree with yeah. you there uh let them do let them do two regular season and two yeah. preseason even. yeah just, i think it should be no two, regular two regular season, season and if you want two preseason have at it yeah yeah but on that note uh i guess that's all for the for this month we'll be back sometime in july i think we're trying to line up a special guest for then but so keep uh keep your eye open on the website but on behalf of david dorman david griggs john sleek and john titel i'm chad sherwood thanks for joining us talk to you again next month.